Good morning, dear saints and blessed Lenten Tide. Welcome to Thy Strong Word. Today is Friday, March 8th, and you're listening to the program where each weekday morning we explore the holy scriptures through which God bespeaks us righteous and nourishes our faith. I'm your host, Pastor Phil Boo of St. John Lutheran Church in Laverne, Minnesota. Today, we now take up Deuteronomy chapter 21, wherein Moses outlines some, well, various laws and regulations, but these focus on societal issues, such as the handling of unsolved murders and regulations for marrying captive women, inheritance rights for the firstborn and dealing with a rebellious son. It emphasizes justice and responsibility and compassion within the community, and it reflects these broader themes that we've been talking about, law, morality, social order in the context of Israel's covenant with God. Whether it's over the air, online at KFUO.org, through a smart speaker, maybe through that KFUO app as a podcast, no matter how you're joining us, I'm just glad you're here. You're the reason we're here. So settle in, open your hearts and your minds. We are about to begin. Thy Strong Word is graciously supported by the Lutheran Heritage Foundation. Go learn more about what they do over at LHFmissions.org. And if you have any questions or comments, concerns or complaints, anything you want to talk about, you can email me, PastorBoo at gmail.com. I regularly get emails from listeners. I love hearing where you're from and how Thy Strong Word is part of your devotional life. You can also find me on Facebook, so feel free to look me up over there. You can also call in. Give us a ring, 1-800-730-2727. But getting right to the matter at hand, because that's why you're here, we're going to welcome the guest. It's going to be, who is it? Oh, it's the Reverend Jim Dobb. He's the pastor of St. Paul Lutheran Church in Havelock, North Carolina, my home state. Good morning, Pastor Dobb. Good morning, Pastor Boo. How are you today? Oh, well, with uh, a balmy 31 degrees in southwest Minnesota, I'm longing for the coast of North Carolina. How is it down there where you are? It would be absolutely sinful and rude to tell you that it's uh, <laughs> blue skies, uh, Carolina blue skies, and 60 degrees and, you know, a nice day. Oh, well, I tell you what, I, I get to look out and see some Carolina blue skies every now and then, even if they are artificial. I there tell you, you know. what, though, I, I'm i going to try to head back. I don't know. i, I got to figure out a vacation this year, so maybe I'll head back to my home state. I grew up in the western part, but visited the eastern part quite a bit just a beautiful state. Um, Anyway, so how have things been going for you? How's God been using you? Anything interesting going on in your life? Well, we have have been, uh, it's nice to see the sun, I should say, because this last week it has been pouring rain. Uh, The the parsonage backyard has become lakefront property. So it's uh, uh, just a ton of rain, but it's nice. But things are exciting. You know, it's busy during the Lenten season. But we just the Lord is is doing wonderful things in our community and and the through the members of the church and and it's just a, great things are happening. That's great. Well, I tell you what. Why don't we go ahead and start with our um, with our prayer, and then we're going to get into this text because Moses has been laying down the law, so to speak, or maybe I should say relaying down the law a second time. It is Deuteronomy, after all. But uh, before we do that, we're going to start our time in prayer. Would you lead us in that, please? Sure. We pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day of your creation. We thank you for all of the the promises that you give to your word, but also the, the curb in the law that is set forth as well. We ask that you would bless our time together this morning and that you would enable us to continue to learn from your holy word so that we may continue to to look to the cross, to be bold witnesses of our Savior, and to be able to share with others that promise that is ours through Christ Jesus alone. This we ask in his most precious name. Amen. Amen. Well, way back in chapter 19, we were introduced to the laws concerning cities of refuge. Um, And actually, that episode didn't go out on the air. I've been dealing with a flu this week. I'm still recovering from it. Uh, But I'll tell you, um, in that chapter, if our people at home would be so kind as to, you know, sometime, if you're listening to this as a podcast, go ahead and pause it and go and head over to Deuteronomy chapter 19 and read that. Um, And if you're not, then go back and read it later. But in any case, that dealt with cities of refuge, avenging homicide, whereas the law here in 21 really turns to the town's culpability. Um, How might you set up our chapter, our discussion for today? 
So really, when when we look at these, the the various laws that we have here in 21, and and I, I think what we have to remember as New Testament Christians looking back at the Old Testament is we we can look at some of these Levitical laws and say, these things are the weirdest, wackiest things. Why why would you need something like that? But but really the, the Levitical laws that are laid out are are key not just for the community, but also the the understanding of of God as the one who provides for his people and and the context in which his people not only need to live, but of how he blesses them as they live as his people. And and so we have the 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 understanding with atonement and 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 care for each other and and how do you um, as we'll see later on uh, in the the chapter of of removing evil from one's midst and things like that and so the 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 city of refuge idea is is you set up a place that if someone needs to to kind of escape in um you know to to be protected but you don't go like kill your brother and then hide in a city or a place as part of a city of refuge to escape any punishment that that was not the idea and and so now here we come into to these uh kind of five five laws in in 21 and and it's trying to understand like what happens in certain situations. And again, it, it comes to the the people are are seen as culpable, if you will. Like the the beginning part of of twenty one, the first few verses, uh, first nine verses is the the unresolved murder. Well, the in the sense the town closest to gets the blame. Well, now it's on the people. And, and I don't want to give too much before we read the text, but, but I think again, it's, it's understanding the Levitical laws, not just for the the people's purity, um, but it's understanding it in terms of God's love towards his people and being able to keep that relationship intact. Let's go ahead and read through this. It's not very long. It's only the first nine verses. Um, Let's start. Uh, This is going to be chapter 21, verse 1, reading from the English Standard Version. If in the land that Yahweh your God is giving you to possess, someone is found slain, lying in the open country, and it is not known who killed him, then your elders and your judges shall come out, and they shall measure the distance to the surrounding cities. And the elders of that city that is nearest to the slain man shall take a heifer that has never been worked and that has not pulled in a yoke. And the elders of that city shall bring the heifer down to a valley with running water, which is neither plowed nor sown, and shall break the heifer's neck there in the valley. Then the priests, the sons of Levi, shall come forward, for Yahweh your God has chosen them to minister to him and to bless in the name of Yahweh. And by their word, every dispute and every assault shall be settled. And all the elders of that city nearest to the slain man shall wash their hands over the heifer whose neck was broken in the valley. And they shall testify, Our hands did not shed this blood, nor did our eyes see it shed. Accept atonement, O Yahweh, for your people Israel, whom you've redeemed, and do not set the guilt of innocent blood in the midst of your people Israel, so that their blood guilt be atoned for. So you shall purge the guilt of innocent blood from your midst when you do what is right in the sight of of Yahweh. So very fascinating, right? So Deuteronomy 19 talks about how no one must shed innocent blood, but if they do shed it innocently, innocently, right? Um, mm-hmm. Then they have a, a, a place to escape. But if anyone sheds innocent blood deliberately, well, then atonement for that crime is the life of the murderer. And so we're dealing with like, what if the murderer is not known? Yeah. Yeah. And and it's interesting is this this picture like the the mental picture I'm 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 picturing like a NCIS or a, a you know Law and Order type scene that they're out there with sticks figuring out who's closest to who, but but really it again it becomes for the people whoever the body to wherever the body is closest that the sin of of that murder falls on the head innocent blood has been shed and now the the heads of those people closest that guilt is now upon them 
and and so it's it's seen now as this this idea of this unresolved murder um the it has to be atoned for it has to be taken away by by something by some way and so god lays out this this idea and and it's interesting of how in in this instance that it's it's a heifer a cow but there's several really kind of cool things that is identified first it's a heifer that's never been hooked to a plow so it's never been used so innocent if you will pure and then it's taken to a valley that has never been used never been plowed innocent pure and then it's taken to where there is a continual river that has never been you know used again pure are you catching my drift on this uh with this and and so now it's notice who are the people that are involved you have the elders you have the and, and the judges the ones who determine it you have the priests and and they're the ones who make the sacrifice and then you have all the people from the city who do the actions on behalf of the folks and and this whole idea of atonement is is very biblical you know we we talk about you know Leviticus 1 Leviticus 4 Leviticus 5 of of the atonement in there but the idea and I'll back up a minute is when you have this innocent murder victim blood being shed and blood tainting the ground it goes all the way back to Cain and Abel, where where here Abel's blood cries out from the land, and and we'll talk a little bit in a minute about why is land so precious? What is why is that so significant? But we have this idea of this atonement that is there, and this transference of the 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 guilt in there. So. Here in, in Yom Kippur is the bull sacrificed by the priest and the sins. I, I always love this picture. The, the priest then takes a goat, puts the sins on the head of that goat, and then run, takes it out to the farthest part of the desert and then runs the goat out. Literally the scapegoat of, of it all. But one of the other really powerful things as we see is after the heifer has been his neck broken notice what the elders or what the priests do they wash their hands and then they declare we're not guilty we we are not we are innocent of the blood that had been shed hmm is that also perhaps maybe foreshadowing another event it, and and I just think there's some really powerful, powerful things um, that we see in this in this text, and and the idea of the river, the flowing river in this valley that's never been plowed with a heifer that's never been used, is the river is one that continually flows. It's not like a river that just shows up because of the rainy season, like in my backyard, and then kind of goes away, but it's one that is from a spring that is kind of eternally fed, eternally runs, and the blood flows down the river and is taken is taken away from there. And so I think, again, there's just some, it seems like a really wacky, wild, weird law, <laughs> but it's one that it shows God's atonement for the people. It shows the, in a sense, foreshadowing of an innocent, innocent animal taking the the symbolic sins of the of the people away as we look forward with new testament eyes of the innocent lamb of god taking away the sins of the people while someone washed their hands saying i am innocent of this man's blood yeah i think that is absolutely clear i mean i can just picture um, you know, Pilate, he washes his hands over the whole situation, which, you know, that's that's a pretty common uh, symbolic gesture throughout. But when you connect it to Deuteronomy here and you you see that God is setting the stage for them to fully understand that a sin must be atoned for. It's not as though, OK, somebody was murdered 
and we don't know who it is, right? Our eyes did not see, it says in verse uh, seven, I think. So, so our eyes didn't see it. We don't know who it was. We can't prove who it was because proof, they don't exactly have CSI Cana, you know? It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or sorry, sorry, pardon me, Canaan. It, it's, uh, it's not, it's not, they don't have a forensic way of determining these things. So really it's just by witnesses. So when someone's murdered, you can't just go, oh, well, it's unsolved. And mm-hmm. one of the things that I found in my studies was there was actually a similar custom in other different East, Near Eastern law codes. So it's not just among the Israelites, although I think this really does connect back to Cain and Abel, as you were talking about. But, but they would have it where if there was a murder and no one was to, to blame or you couldn't find anyone to blame, you couldn't figure out who did it then the city nearest had to uh, give reparations to the family of the murderer. So they actually had to pay. Yeah. In yeah. this case, they don't have to pay, but the atonement ends up coming in because, you know, how much can you really pay for someone's life? Go ahead. Well, I- exactly. And, and, and then the other question becomes, well, what happens if you do find the murderer and it say it comes from that city or he comes or she comes from the, a, a different city. Well, ultimately then the punishment is then brought on to that person. And then they are, are punished according to, according to the law. Now, if that means that they're put to death, well, then they're put to death as prescribed what God's law says. And, and so it's not like, oh, well, that sin's already been atoned for, so we don't have to worry about any kind of consequences. By no means is they still have to, The if the murderer is found, the murderer still has to pay for what they have done. But if they're never found, the city is not held liable forever and always right. under God's law. You know, and I, I think this is an interesting concept. Think about cities. Now, I'm not talking about charlotte or raleigh or something like that bigger cities but just like a smaller town you know if they had an unsolved murder uh, you know it it would it could just possibly go into the cold case file and you never sort of hear of it again maybe once a decade they'll take a peek at it but really there ends up being no justice Mm -hmm. god sets it up here where there is going to be justice regardless and that the city itself has to take responsibility for the fact that no one is is uh is being um charged with this crime that they can't find out who did it i mm-hmm. think that that would make the leaders of the the city and even the people that much more on guard against violence in their community because if 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 there's crimes being committed and they're doing nothing to stop or 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 help people then frankly they're going to have to pay that penalty but it, but in this case the penalty is then purified away from them which puts it on God, which teaches us a spiritual message. But just from a civic point of view, it seems like being responsible for the, the crimes in your city isn't necessarily a bad policy for leaders. Exactly. Exactly. And and also it it, it serves and we'll see these in a, in a couple of the examples coming up. Is it and, and what we saw in in 19 and, and 20 is it helps also keep responsibility but also purge out evil. Right. And, and I think that's one of the things that some of these Levitical laws that we don't necessarily kind of connect with our mind today is the idea of purging out the evil, that you don't keep the evildoer among you because there's no consequences. And we, with God's law, there's, there's always consequences. I, you know what? And what you said is really important. There is no such thing as a uh, a, a sin that doesn't matter. <laughs> Correct. Know, we talk about Correct. kinds of righteousness. So, of course, you know, between us and our neighbors, different kinds of sins might matter more or less than other kinds of sins. So, but before God, all sins are equally damning. So it, Jesus says, you know, if you lust after someone with your own heart, you've already committed adultery against them. If you're angry with your brother, you've already committed murder against him. Before God, there's really no difference. Now, to your brother, he'd much prefer you be angry with him without cause than actually murder him. So when it comes to this world, there are greater and lesser sins. But before God, all sin 
is indicative of our rebellion against him and must be atoned for. And in this time before Christ came, all of this, and, and, and is this what you're saying? All of this seems to be leading up to you need to understand that every sin, no matter how big or small, of course, these are big, um, carry with it guilt. And that guilt must be atoned for. And then, of course, one day we will have that final atonement at, from their point of view. And we do have that in Jesus. It, exactly. And and the difference for us today is that that for, for well, that one and done, if you will, that one and done atonement for us has been done on the cross. Unfortunately, Old Testamentally, you are always constantly atoning because you have to keep you keep sinning, and so it, by obeying the law, you have to keep making sacrifices over and over and over for every one of those sins. And and that's the, the graciousness that God, through Christ, shows to us by all of our sin has been laid on our Savior and, and nailed to the cross for us. And, and what a, a, an amazing promise that becomes for us. Um, and that that we carry with us, um, and it, that I don't have to to slaughter a a heifer in my uh, in my ditch between me and the parsonage, or we have to cut up bulls in front of the altar every Sunday. I, well, my altar guild probably wouldn't like that anyway. Could you imagine? <laughs> you know, but we have That's exactly what I thought of too. You know, I feel guilty when I spill so. a little wine on the on the frontal cloth or on the uh, on the on the fair linen or something. I feel bad about that. I couldn't imagine. You yeah. Know? Okay. Yeah, well, yeah. Here you but, go, Carol. Here you go, Dolores. I need you to take up <laughs> haul that bowl out for then me. Then we'd probably all have like tile and we just hose it down or something. I don't know, you know. But but I, I guess we're, I'm just thankful, you know, that we have that. But I think we look back on these Levitical laws, and and we. Re- we're reminded that yes, God is a God of order, but it it's order for the sake of his love for his people to keep that order in there, if that makes sense. Um, but you know, it's, yeah, there's a, there's just a, a lot of kind of things we look back and we're like, man, I'm glad I don't have to do that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, uh, anything else about this section before we move on to the next? Because the next also really, I, I, I hope, doesn't apply to us today, but certainly something we need to go through. No, I, let's 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 tackle the next one. All right. Well, here we go. Uh, we uh, are going to go into now verses ten through fourteen. When you go out to war against your enemies, and Yahweh your God gives them into your hand, and you take them captive, and you see among the captives. A beautiful woman, and you desire to take her to be your wife, and you bring her home to your house, she shall shave her head and pare her nails, and she shall take off the clothes in which she was captured and shall remain in your house and lament her father and her mother a full month. After that, you may go into her and be her husband, and she shall be your wife. But if you no longer delight in her, you shall let her go where she wants. But you shall not sell her for money, nor shall you treat her as a slave, since you have humiliated her okay goodness gracious <laughs> yeah yeah, right? yeah what is this about so the, you know this is like four verses or five verses and 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 you're going huh and and i think what we have to understand is culturally i i think that there's a a fair bit of of cultural understanding that perhaps i i don't think necessarily we kind of get our, our filters are, are a bit different, but, but we have to remember that often um, women were, were kind of the, the spoils of war, if you will. Um, now one would assume from the text and, and, and again, there's sometimes danger in assuming things is that this is probably being spoken to in reference to uh, soldiers who are single. Well, Polygamy was a very common thing, not necessarily um, encouraged by or, or looked highly upon the Lord uh, that, that he wanted this. Um, it, it was done. We, we see examples in scripture of that. But, you know, we think about this, that this was God was laying out aspects of if this is 
going to be done. Here's how this is to be. Um, one of the the kind of the forbidden uh, people that that the children of Israel were not allowed to marry were the Canaanites, and so this, you know, textually probably did not uh, or did not apply to the to the Canaanites, but. There's some some things in here that that are also read into that that we kind of assume that with the text, you know, that um, that it most likely is when they talk about, especially towards the to the end where it says, uh, um, you know, that you take her as your wife, that there may or may not have been physical relation first and then in there. But, um, you know, but there's just some things that we, you know, Scripture doesn't like give us every every detail but it's interesting that there's there's three kind of specific steps that if someone takes over uh an area they and they the israelites win a battle and they find one of the soldiers finds a a, a young woman who is very pleasing to the eye and and it says i would like her as my wife three things they have to do one is shave her head trim her nails and and give her new clothes and and someone would say well that's so humiliating you know how much time do women spend on their hair and and the beauty of their clothes and so you know some could say that is you know oh you're just trying to to make her uh, become ugly or something like that but but really there's somewhat of a, a symbolic aspect is that this is now a new life that she's coming from her old to her new it's not that she's becoming this slave or or things like that but it's a almost like an act of purification if you will leaving her her status as a captured person and now coming into as a free person being part of the children of israel uh, kind of a transformation if you will um, the the idea of changing one's clothes it's it's throwing off the the old self the old sinful rags and and putting on the new self uh, putting on Christ you know looking at say Ephesians four Colossians three Romans six um, but there's also that thirty day period that's talk that is talked about is that to give time for grieving um, now here's where some commentators will say well this is that there's to be, um, you know, no sexual relations because they they were showing that they're different. It, the people of Israel were different as captors. It, you know, one commentator mentioned, well, this was to see whether or not the the woman was pregnant or not. Um, but I think it also just shows compassion. You know, here the children of Israel, the the soldiers, just won a battle. They have now taken this person from their home. They have completely removed them from the things they know. And so they are showing in a way that they are not acting like some of the other people, how some of maybe these other folks' um, um, enemies have acted uh, with that. And Brother, I'm going so, to interrupt you because I want you to yeah. hold on to this idea of compassion and certainly, and we're going to think about this and talk about it when we get back from the break, but also the concept of what would the alternative or what could the alternative have been for this woman uh, or these wives that were taken? So we're going to talk about that when we get back. So folks, don't go anywhere. Pastor Dobb and I will keep on going when we come back. See you on the other side. These are the voices of young Lutherans in Mexico City, children who are excited to learn more about their Savior, Jesus. But they need our help because good Lutheran books for kids in the Spanish language are in short supply in Mexico. To learn how you can help tell Spanish-speaking kids everywhere about Jesus in a language they can understand, go to the Lutheran Heritage Foundation website at lhfmissions.org forward slash Juan 316.
Welcome back to Thy Strong Word. I'm your host, Pastor Phil Wu. With me today, it's the Reverend Jim Dobb, pastor of St. Paul Lutheran Church in Havelock, North Carolina. Don't forget, folks, you can contact me at pastorboo at gmail.com or on Facebook with your questions, comments, or more. You can also call in with your questions, 1-800-730-2727. Okay, Pastor, I had to interrupt you. I'm sorry we were right up against a break, but you were making this great point about how, yes, we're talking about going off to war and killing the men and bringing the women home. And, and, it, and it's so antithetical to our modern understanding of what even war looks like, but that is not the case for these people. That is not the case for this time in history. So we have this woman and she comes home with the, and, and, and let's be honest, not what she wants, but she comes home with the Israelite, but whereas more savage nations might have brutalized her God says, no, give her time to mourn, then completely cleanse her of, you know, shave her head, pare her nails. There's probably some hygienic reasons for that, too. Take off the clothes she was captured in, put, you know, she gets new clothes. She's 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 mourning. But then after that, she can be your wife. Um, there is a compassion here, although, of course, the the strict. The strict humanitarian in us would say, well, there's no compassion in taking anybody against their will. Well, what does it say right here? If she uh, uh, um, but if you no longer delight in her, you should let her go where she wants. Now, it doesn't say anything about her wanting to leave. Let's be honest. But there are alternatives to what could have happened to women in these situations. So there is compassion built in. But I feel like this is a compassion based on. A hardness of heart, so to speak, uh, kind of like even Moses is uh, allowing people to have a certificate of divorce because of the hardness of their hearts, because God is dealing with us in a world that we live in. Not he definitely proclaims to us exactly what he how he wants us to live. But he also knows we've talked about this before. He says things like when you go into Canaan, uh, do not uh uh, kill all the people. Take just re- remove them from the face of the earth, and then he says, "Don't marry them." Well, why tell us not to marry them if you told us to destroy them? Because God knows that he that we that, that they're not going to, and so we see this we see this all the time. So, do you feel like it lands in some some uh, in that area somewhere? Did that make any sense at all? Brother, are you there? I don't know if I can. I can't hear you. Well, I am on the air, so I'm going to keep on going. But it looks like we might have lost our guest during the break, uh, or perhaps he's on mute. Hopefully he'll come back very soon. But slavery was common in the ancient Near East. And so laws like these in the Old Testament represent common practices, but not the ideal. You know, God certainly doesn't want them to go off and 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 uh, have have wars against people, especially for the purposes of carting off their of their loved ones. But there are situations where war happens and then you have these displaced people. What do you do with them? So the alternatives you know, most women in such circumstances would become servants in other cultures. They would become slaves or concubines. Um, but but God recognizes the idea that some Israelite men would inevitably take them as wives. Is that what he wants? But he knows that's what's going to happen. And so the, the law here governs behavior towards such women. We would not endorse this today, but God is working with people where they are. It reminds me a lot of the passage where, where God says, slaves, obey your masters. Well, does God want slavery? Does God endorse slavery? No. But God says to Christian slaves through the scriptures, obey your masters. For what purpose? Well, to be able to preserve that witness. We, we continue to do this when we obey our employers or even our parents uh, and those in authority over us, fourth commandment stuff. So, so sometimes the Bible or often the Bible talks about people in the situations they're in, but it isn't giving, you know, God's permission to behave in such a way. In fact, this is limiting people's behavior. All right. Well, the next section is going to be inheritance rights of the firstborn. 
And I'm going to go ahead and read it as hopefully they're going to try to get my guest back on and the your air. Your guest is back. We, I have hey. no idea what happened with technology. You were talking and then it just <sighs> went. My numbers were on the screen and there wouldn't. Your sound oh, just no. went away. But well, I'm glad you're back. I, I pretty much just wrapped up the, the marrying female captives parts as by saying, you know, listen, this isn't God saying this is exactly how I really want life to be. Rather, it's God saying, listen, I, I know what's going to happen. There are going to be wars. And I know what's going to happen. You're going to want to take wives. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to treat them compassionately. Exactly. Perfect. That, you, I couldn't have said it better myself through silence on the, on the radio. How about that? <laughs> Sounds good. Well, let's get into the next part. I'm going to go ahead and uh, read uh, just the three verses that we have, and then I'm going to rest my voice a while I'll let you take it. Verse 15. If a man has two wives, the one loved and the other unloved, and both the loved and the unloved have borne him children, and if the firstborn son belongs to the unloved, then on the day when he assigns his possessions as an inheritance to his sons, he may not treat the son of the loved one as the firstborn in preference to the son of the unloved, who is the firstborn. But he shall acknowledge the firstborn, the son of the unloved, by giving him a double portion of all that he has, for he is the firstfruits of his strength. The right of the firstborn is his. Okay, now that's a little complicated. It has a lot more to do with first sons than wives, but I do want to uh, to sort of throw it out there. Does God permit men to have more than one wife? It, it should, well, maybe permits permits not the word endorse like like uh, 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 want men to be able to have more than two wives, or is this another situation where He's dealing with them in the reality in which they live? Well, I, I think your your last point is the correct point, is dealing with the reality. Um, I, I know, you know, I've heard this this as a proof text of, uh, as, as well as several others from the Old Testament of, of why polygamy should be, you know, think about Abraham, Jacob, David, Solomon, you know, all, all having more than one wife um, and, and other things. But, but, you know, we could say that on this passage, God permits it or even defends it, encourages polygamy. But, you know, I, I think the, at a stretch, tolerate might be the word, you know, but it's using that in there. But notice in every one of the, the circumstances where polygamy has been, there, there has been great pain. There has been great sa sadness. Love has been fractured and harmony and trust has been broken. So in keeping with the, the you know, the marriage bed uh, be pure, and, and marriage is one husband, one wife, one man, one woman, um, this was the, that was God's design, God's plan. You know, now does that mean that every marriage is, is there's no, there's, it's always rainbows, unicorns, happiness? No, you know, we're sinners this side of heaven. We will have discord. But the, this law is interesting because the, the firstborn male was the one who was to always take care of the family and especially take care of his mother and take care of any other siblings under. And so if you have a, um, say, a, a two-wife situation, but you're the firstborn is from the wife that you don't really like, but say the secondborn is from the wife that you really like, and so you want to make sure that you give him more stuff. This law is it prevents that uh, in there, and and it's it's kind of you know again it's kind of counterintuitive to how we think today, but it was. The, the it was the protection of the the, the people. Now, it, it meant you know greater wealth for the firstborn. Also meant a lot more responsibility. You know, he was the one who was to take care of the family and and all those things. But this law also protected the the children and the wife who perhaps were were unloved. 
it protected them from abuse against the 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 husband protected them from abuse against the other wives or the other children um and and i think that was you know simple few verses but it's being able to to take care of their the family the family unit well and you mentioned too about in instances where there are more than one wife you know how this this often and and maybe almost always ends in a lot of of hurt feelings and betrayal and and just it's not how God designed it as you said. Well, even in this instance, you know, it's talking about a man who has two wives, one loved and one unloved, and, and it tells yeah. him you've taken responsibility of these two women, um, and and it means a lot more today. I mean, sorry, then than it did today. Today, yeah. a woman could. Uh, sever herself from her husband or any other man and and be quite successful in this world and 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 that's wonderful um but at the same time back then that's that's just absolutely not the case so he's taking responsibility for these women and so even if you don't like one you still you can't treat her you can't treat her 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 children differently because of that i mean so again that's this is god dealing with people in the real world and uh something that that while we're uncomfortable with um would have probably been radically, uh, I hate to use the word, but progressive for that day. It would have been radically uh, different than the surrounding nations. Exactly. And you, and you look at it, in each of these laws, it's not only dealing with First Commandment stuff, you know, God at, at the center, but you're dealing with Fourth Commandment, Fifth Commandment, Sixth Commandment, you know, the, the obeying father and mother, you know, not stealing, not murdering. And and here in in this is is the um, or not committing adultery, but uh, you could add seventh commandment and they're not stealing. Is you're not stealing the stuff, um, you know? Is this we're dealing with all of the commandments that God sets for His people? Again, not because He's mean and and is got nothing better to do than come up with all kinds of laws, but it's taking care of the people, setting His people apart from the other nations, the other ungodly, you know, people who, who worship false gods. Here's the true God leading his people, guiding his people, providing for his people, loving his people, and, and blessing his people in the parameters of the things that he sets up for his people. So it's been kind of interesting. We have had, as Moses, going through these different laws— uh, it's kind of like, what are the connections between all of these laws? But we started back in 19 with cities of refuge, and then we're talking about cities. Then we started talking about property boundaries. And if we're talking about people uh, not seeing murders, we started talking about witnesses. And then we went into now what we just talked about earlier with unsolved murders. And then with unsolved murders, um, you have the idea of warfare. And so now we have female captives. And then we went from female captives now to the inheritance rights of the firstborn. So if you have a, a wife, then they're going to have children. It has sort of this logical thread through it, although it is a little tenuous. And so now yeah. it's just fascinating because we've gone from now marrying female captives, so having wives, now to having children. And then in now our section, we're going to talk about a rebellious child, what to do with a son who is rebellious. We've already talked about what to do if you have two wives and you don't want to treat their sons equally, but what about a rebellious son? We're going to pick it up with 18. If a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and though they discipline him, will not listen to them, then his father and his mother shall take hold of him and bring him out to the elders of his city at the gate of the place where he lives. And they shall say to the elders of his city, this our son is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. Then all the men of the city shall stone him to death with stones, and so shall you purge the evil from your midst, and all Israel shall hear and fear. Okay, absolutely not the most important thing of this text, but I want to point out at the very top, I love this because we get this idea that, well, we're, we're presented with this idea from enemies of Christianity and enemies of faith that Men just ruled over women, and, and women had no say-so, no authority in their lives. They were basically just property. And in some contexts, that was true. But we've been talking about how the differences God wants for his people. Well, I don't know if it's, it just stands out to others, but look at this. It says, 
um, if they will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and though they discipline him, he will not listen to them, then they both shall take him. I, I see here a, a co-parenting, right? It, this is this is not, you know, uh, uh, wives, you have to keep silent and stay in the kitchen. This is, this is they're both raising their children. I, you know, not the most important point from this section, but I think one worth raising. Absolutely. And, and see, and, and the, the neat thing, I guess, if you want to call it a neat thing in there, is that it's not one, as you say, the co-parenting, it's not one parent against another. And it's not the, the you know, it, it's not that the parents haven't done their, done their due diligence in trying to take care of their child you know, and trying to, to raise up the proper, raise up their child in a way. We have here, and you, you can almost kind of see like a, a picturesque of, of these just exasperated parents who finally bring their child, like, an, you know, an adult, you know, adult child to, um, to the, the leaders of the church saying, I'm done. We, we've tried everything. But, and, and it's interesting. We in in I think chapter twenty is is the two witnesses. You you can't just have one person say, well, this person did this and this person did that, and and then you believe it in the in the courts. And so here you're bringing the two witnesses. It's the parents who are are testifying. My child is is a a problem. Here's the things they've done, and and so. It's interesting that while they've tried to discipline their son, while they've tried to do everything to to keep their son, you know, in the on the straight and narrow, it, it just didn't work. And so now it's beyond just the parents. Now it's the responsibility of the community. And and it's interesting that, that we look at this and it's brought to the elders and and when it comes time for judgment, notice it's not the parents who are part of the of the judgment. It's now the the elders, and and it's they deem they deem him first a, a worthless squanderer, a drunk. It, it's not the person per se. It's his behavior. So now he is deemed stubborn, rebellious, and now comes to the the punishment for there, and and it's. The, there, there's the the one um, commentary I was uh, looking through and, and just kind of getting some back history. They're like, well, if the parents just kind of ignore it, they're just as culpable. And, you know, how many times, and I'm not a parent. We don't have, my wife and I do not have kids. We have two dogs. And, you know, my dogs sometimes are a little bit on the wild side. How many parents have had kids who are on the wild side? And you're just like, well, just do something about it. But the parents are exhausted. And, and you can kind of see that, you know, here they're exhausted. But yet the sins of the son have a broader effect than just the house. How often have rebellious kids just wreaked havoc in a community? And so what does God say, you know, in the, in the end is that you have to purge the evil from your midst. Again, this is a several several times the Lord says this is to purge the evil from the midst, so as to what affects one is going to affect everyone, and so if you don't do it, it will ultimately affect the community. This whole situation reminds me a lot of those poor, unfortunate situations where parents relinquished their children over to the state. Um, and yeah. it's such a horrible situation. I, in this case, too, I want to point out that, and again, these are just details, doesn't really have to do with the major point, but these, these aren't bratty teenagers they're dragging to the city gates. I mean, these are gluttons and drunkards. These are people who have basically grown to manhood and they can't control. Um, I don't, I, these aren't toddlers who they're upset with. Um, but you're right, the overarching theme, and I think the, the focus should be this idea that God is not permitting Talk about strict, right? God is not permitting any sin to to be in the midst of his people because, well, like Levin, right? He knows that it will infect the whole dough. Let's move right on because we have a few last verses, but they're important. 22 through 23, which is the end of our text. And if a man has committed crime punishable by death, 
and he is put to death, and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night on the tree, but you shall bury him the same day. For a hanged man is cursed by God. You shall not defile your land that Yahweh your God is giving you for an, in- an inheritance. Excuse me. So uh, it seems to be a little passing comment about, hey, if you're going to hang somebody because of their terrible crime, then you know take them down off the tree. But obviously this has greater implications for us Christians, doesn't it? Oh, it does. And, and here's the bookends. The, you know, the first part of 21 talks about the, mur- you know, uh, unresolved murder, uh, identified murder, because it, it affects the land. Here's why it affects the land, this last part. Notice that it's not that the guy's hung from the tree to die. He's already been, he's already been executed. And now he's hung on the, on the tree, on a pole, you know, to show the people, here's what happens when you do something that is deserving of death, you will be displayed. And, and the idea now is the curse is on the man, right? God's punishment is on the man. Um, but it's, it's the problem with if you leave it overnight it's that then the, 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 the dirt, the land, the world gets defiled underneath there. And what is that land underneath there? That is the, the whole land that God has given to his people. So while you see the, the, the cursed person, you don't defile the land that is holy from God. And so here we have that powerful image that in the Old Testament, the, the tree was not actually the instrument by which the person was put to death. It was the display. But we look now, especially in this Lenten season, what, is, what does Paul say? Cursed is everyone um, who is hung from the tree. Well, Jesus is the one who not only is hung on the tree, alive, but is also cursed by God for our sin. And his blood falls upon the land and now makes all things holy by there, that that connection in there. And what a beautiful picture, you know, that instead of sin, the curse being displayed as the deterrent, we now have Christ on the cross as the hope and the peace and the comfort of knowing that our sin was on Christ as the curse for us so that by his stripes we have been made whole, we have been healed, and we have forgiveness of sins. And by his death, by his rising, we have life everlasting with him. Powerful image in two little verses. You know... People look back at these parts of the Old Testament and looking just on the level one, they think, wow, this was just such a harsh and and, and really difficult existence to live. And and God just seems so strict. But I I think all those things are true. (laughs) I think they're absolutely true. But you have to be willfully ignoring how God is working through history to not see how it connects to Christ. And you've done a great job of pointing us to Christ, brother, because as we look at these things now, we look back and we say, look at all these laws. Do, they don't apply to us anymore, do they? Well, God's law continues to apply to us. But now we live out God's will for our lives in response to that salvation that he has given us through Christ. And we, we don't have to suffer blood guilt because Christ has suffered it for us. And, and all of that was being preached to the people through these very laws. So even in the law, you know, it, 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 yes, it always accuses us. Yes, it absolutely convicts us in our sins, but it prepares our hearts for Jesus. And I'm thankful that you came on to prepare our hearts for Jesus. Any last things before we go? Well, I, I appreciate being with you, and, and I, it frustrates me when I hear people say, not, not Lutherans, but others say, well, we've got Jesus, we don't need the Old Testament. Oh, well, without the Old right. Testament, we would not be able to not only know the prophecies, but understand our Savior and look forward to life everlasting with Him. 
I, I almost wonder, and, and we only have a few minutes left, but I almost wonder if we as pastors, as churches, would do better, and this is just off the cuff, <laughs> right? So I have people my, at my church listening, I'm sure. But if we did, maybe we should just focus on the Old Testament for our kids as they're growing up. I mean, certainly point them to Jesus, don't get me wrong, but I don't know that we do yeah. a good enough job. I, I think we hit the Bible stories, which is fine, but I wonder if we do a good enough job of tracing those paths in a way that they can grow up appreciating. I don't know, just off the cuff. You don't have to respond well, and, <laughs> if you don't want and, No, and this is why, you know, I, I don't just preach the gospel every gospel lesson every Sunday. I'll, I'll put in the epistle or I'll bring in the Old Testament, too. Like this Sunday's Old Testament is amazing because it's the story of the serpent on the pole and it points us right to John 316. And oh, yeah. it's, you know, amazing stuff, the connections. Well, thank you so much, brother, for being on the show. That's been the Reverend Jim Dobb, pastor of St. Paul Lutheran Church in Havelock, North Carolina. I can't wait to have you back on. Thank you, brother. Appreciate it. Blessed uh, rest of Lent and Easter. Thank you. All right, folks, join us again on Monday as we turn the page into Deuteronomy chapter 22. More laws, but the Reverend Christopher Craig will be joining us as we hear Moses reiterate God's laws for the Israelites regarding uh, personal property and then sexual immorality. Two big Bye-bye. topics. Until then, may God's peace and blessings be with you all as we pray. Father, keep us in thy strong word.